Hey everyone, Professor Dustin here, and in this video I'm going to show you how Maxwell's equations um, predict that light behaves as a wave. So um, there's lots of reasons to believe that light behaves as a wave. Uh, experimentally, it was known uh, basically in the early 1800s uh, when Thomas Young did his double slit and other kind of interference pattern experiments. Um, Maxwell's equations is the theory behind why light behaves as a wave, and Maxwell was around in the 1860s. So we are talking about very historical physics here, but these are the two reasons why we believe light behaves as a wave through the experiments and also through the theory. So I'm going to real quickly go through the theory of why we can use Maxwell's equations and the equations of electromagnetism to predict that light should actually be a wave. So first, I'm going to write down Maxwell's equations. The first one says the divergence of the E field is the uh, basically the density of the charge. That's Gauss's law. The next one is going to be the famous no magnetic monopoles. That's the divergence of the B field is zero. That doesn't have its own special name, but it does um, imply that there are no source charges, or individual source charges for the magnetic field. The next one tells us that the curl of the B field um, can be created by a current, and also a current can create a changing E field. Normally we think of it the other way, the changing E field can create a current, and all together this is called Ampere's law. And then finally we have an equivalent statement like this, um, except for the E and B field being switched on this side, which is Faraday's law. And that is Faraday's law. So I've written these assuming that we have some kind of sources, uh, some kind of current, and some kind of uh, charge density. So the first thing I'm going to do in order to prove that this set of equations actually um, predicts the existence of electromagnetic waves is I'm first going to say that we have a source-free uh, region. So the reason for doing that is partly to make things simpler. If you can create electromagnetic waves in a source-free region, why not do that? Why prove it for the case of sources? Uh, but of course, we know that light propagates across vast distances in space, and so we should expect that if light is going to be a wave, we should be able to have it in vacuum. And so that's actually something that's a little bit special about this. Source-free says that there are no charges of any kind anywhere, and there's also no electric field of any kind anywhere. So this is a special feature of the electromagnetic field that it can uh, propagate through vacuum. It does not need sources in order to propagate. Now we are not talking about how to create electric and magnetic fields. In those cases, you need sources. You need to have um, either electromagnetic fields creating other electromagnetic fields, but also you might need uh, currents or charges. So we are just talking about the propagation of electromagnetic fields, not the creation of electromagnetic fields. I'll also point out that it implies a nice symmetry in these equations, which means that now for Gauss's law, divergence of E is zero and the divergence of B is zero. For Ampere's law, the curl of B plus the time derivative of E is zero, and then the curl of E and the time derivative of B is zero. So there's a nice symmetry that happens when you take the source-free examples of the electromagnetic field. So the next thing we're going to do is a slight, another slight simplification, which is we are going to assume that we have an existing electric field, which is in just the Z direction. So this electric field could depend on the position in space, and it could also depend on the time. But what's special is we're just going to pick a particular direction. Now, there's actually no restriction we're doing here. We just have an electric field which exists in space, and we're going to pick our z direction to be pointed in the same direction as that electric field. And so that's what I'm doing here. So I'm not specifying anything about the functional form of the electric field, just that it is directed in the z direction. OK, so now let's go about solving Maxwell's equations for this particular electric field. First, let's solve the divergence equation, Gauss's law. So the divergence V in Cartesian coordinates is very simple. You're basically taking the dot product of the uh, del operator with the electric field. Um, so you get the uh, x derivative of x, y derivative of y, z derivative of z. And of course, that's going to be equal to zero. That's what Gauss's law in uh, free space tells us. So what that tells us is that our derivative of E in the z direction is going to be zero because we already have specified that we don't have any uh, components in either x or y. So now we now know that the derivative of this ez is going to be zero. Now that we know that, let's uh, put that into Faraday's law to figure out, or at least let's put it, figure out what the curl of e is going to be, because if the derivative in the z direction is zero, let's see what the curl of e is going to be. So now remembering how the uh, curl looks like in the Cartesian coordinates. So remember the pattern that the curl looks like. We have um, uh, y, z, and then we have z, y. That's in the x direction. We have a minus sign for the y direction. Uh, x, z, minus z, x. That's in the y direction. And then uh, y, x, minus x, y in the z direction. 
Okay, so a bunch of these things are zero because we specified that E was only in the Z direction. So this guy is gonna be zero, uh, this guy is gonna be zero, and this entire thing is gonna be zero. So now we are gonna make one more assumption, which is we are actually gonna pick how the electric field is going to vary, meaning that we are not gonna allow the electric field to vary over any arbitrary point in space and every arbitrary point in time. We're just gonna say that the electric field is only going to vary uh, along the x direction. So it's not gonna vary in either um, y or z. So this is now going to be just the x direction, specifically uh, not y or z. And what that means is that this term down here is going to go away because we're assuming that in the z direction it does not depend on y. And so what we have is that the curl of E is this the derivative of the z component um, with respect to x in the y direction. Okay, so now we're going to take a closer look at solving Faraday's law now that we've figured out what the curl of E is in this situation. So specifically, we determine that the curl of E in the x and z directions is zero. But that implies that the derivative with respect uh, of the magnetic field with respect to time is also zero because this equation has to be true for each and every um, component individually. So if we put a little x there, there's got to be a little x there. And so if that thing is zero, then the b in the x direction also has to be zero. So we've got two vanishing components of the magnetic field as well as the vanishing components of the curl of E. Okay, so that means that for Faraday's law, we only have one component and that is in the y direction using the equation I just used, uh, just derived previously for the curl of E, and now the derivative of B, which is that. And you see we can get lots of mixing of components here, right? This is the derivative in the Z direction with respect to X in Y hat, and this is now the derivative of B in the Y direction with respect to T, also in the Y direction. So this is all one direction, but it does contain lots of components, other components of the electromagnetic field. That's very characteristic of electromagnetic waves. So in other words, the B field in this situation, where the E field is only in the Z direction, the B field is only in the Y direction, and we're gonna make a further simplification, which is we are actually not gonna consider all possible variations of the B field. We are just gonna consider variations of uh, the B field that are also in X. So variations that are also in the X direction in the same way that the electric field variations were in the X direction. So this is X, specifically not uh, Y or Z. Okay, now that we've done that, let's go back and solve Ampere's law. So Ampere's law, we're gonna have to do it again in two parts, curl of B, time derivative of E. So let's start with the curl of B. And again, I'm gonna write down the curl in a fully fleshed out Cartesian coordinates, which looks like that. And our next step is to get rid of all the stuff that we know doesn't exist or it does not depend on the coordinate that the derivative is being taken with respect to. So how do we go about doing that? Well. Uh, we know that B is only in the Y direction, so any B X's and B Z's we can make go away. So there's a Z, uh, there's a Z and an X, and there's an X. Um, and finally, we know that the in the Y direction, only the uh, X dependence matters. And so we have a B Y B Z D Z right there. And so all we're left with is this one remaining term there, the uh, derivative of B in the Y direction with respect to X. And that is in the Z direction. So now referring back to Ampere's law, we can use much of the same um, a technique we used to show that the derivative of the B field had only one component here. We've now shown that the curl of the B field has only one component. Um, it's in the Z hat direction. That means that the time derivative of the E field in uh, X and Z is also zero. So we only have a time derivative in the Z hat direction. And so we get out of this nasty thing, just two terms. The derivative of B in the uh, the y component of the b with respect to x in the z direction uh, minus 1 over c and then uh, de now e is only in the z direction with respect to time z hat and that equals zero because in the source free region I uh, ampere's law says that uh, the co that combination will equal zero so we've got basically one more step to take, and I'm going to grab uh, these two equations here and get us onto a nice clean sheet, that one up there and this one down here. Okay, so here's what we have um, now. It does appear to be a bit of a mishmash of symbols. Uh, there's a few things we want to identify before we do any more work. First, yeah, these are vector equations in the sense that they only are true in the y direction. That's what the 
y hat vectors are saying, and this is only true in the z direction. But of course, like this component is true in the y direction, independent of any directionality of the equation, right? This is just uh, a vector which happens to point in the y direction. If this thing vanishes, it's clear that these two components without the y um, a unit vector in there also vanish together. In other words, I can divide this equation uh, so kind of by the y hat, and then these two things should equal zero on their own. Same thing down here. I can sort of pull out the z hat and show that that thing should cancel with that thing to get zero. So let's first get rid of the reference to the vector nature of these equations. Okay, cool. So now the pattern should be kind of obvious or becoming more obvious. We have only a y component of b, only a z component of v. Uh, there's a time derivative on e, the opposite, on each of them, actually, and then there's an x derivative on each of them. Um, otherwise, the equations are very similar, except for an extra negative sign uh, right there and the negative sign right there. So we can actually make these two look very, very similar to each other if we take a derivative of x of one of them and a derivative of t of the other. It doesn't actually matter which order we do this. I'm going to take a t derivative of, this, of that one and then take an x derivative of the other one. So let me make an argument in favor of doing this. Uh, now imagine what these two equations will look like if I take a t derivative here and an x derivative here. This term will be dby dx dt, so I have a double derivative here of x and t. I will have the same thing right here. I'll take a, an x derivative, I'll have dby dx dt. So here will be the same thing as this because of course the derivatives commute. It doesn't matter what direction I take the derivatives in. So I'll be able to eliminate the magnetic field completely because there'll be the same thing here as there is here. So that's why I want to do this, because that is going to combine these two equations into one. Now the same thing is not going to happen with the electric field because I take a t derivative here and I get a double t derivative, double x derivative here, so this trick doesn't work for the electric field, but it does eliminate the magnetic field. If I had switched the t and x, meaning if I had taken this t derivative and this x derivative, I could have eliminated the electric field. So that's what I meant by it doesn't matter which order I do this. Well, anyway, so let's get on with it, and I'll take the x derivative of this guy first which looks like that, you can see what happened. I get a second x derivative here, whereas here I have a second derivative first of x and then of t. So now let's take the t derivative of the second equation there. And you can see what happened is I now have the second derivative of b with respect to t and x, and then the second derivative of e with respect to t. And now what happened, uh, what I said was gonna happen does indeed happen, which is I have this term the same as this term. Remember, I can switch the order of the derivatives and it doesn't matter. So I can now like, solve for like this guy, for instance, and plug him in right there and get a single equation for the electric field. Now this is just a little bit of algebra. You gotta chase around the C's a little bit, um, but the final result is the following, is that. So now you, we can see that we have an equation which is just for the, the electric field now. So it's just E, the electric field in just the Z direction. Of course, we set that to be the only direction the electric field is in. And we have a second derivative with respect to x over here and a second derivative with respect to t over here. Now this is almost what we would call the wave equation. Now in order to get to the sort of wave equation that we are most familiar with, you have to divide by uh, a factor of c. So that goes away and you get a c squared on the bottom there. But this is now an equation which you may or may not be familiar with from some of your other uh, physics and math work, but it is called the wave equation. Once we have equations like this, we know that the properties, uh, the, the variables on the inside of the equation, the functions, satisfy waves. They are waves. So um, by waves, what I mean is a, a solution such as, such as that, a, that's a wave with an amplitude E naught traveling at a particular speed, which is given by a combination of W and K. That particular combination of W and K is related to the speed of light now. The speed of light is the speed that electromagnetism travels in the vacuum. The electromagnetic field travels in the vacuum, and of course this is the sort of proof of the speed of light, right? Okay, so we haven't demonstrated the speed of light has some kind of maximum value, but we have basically demonstrated that the electromagnetic field, when it propagates through the vacuum, travels with a specific speed, whatever this value is here. Now we know from Maxwell's equations that that value is C. So this is also a demonstration that all electromagnetic fields in the vacuum travel at exactly the same speed, whatever C is. They are waves because we know that this kind of um, solution too easy actually satisfies this equation. You could take it, plug it into here, take two derivatives, take two time derivatives, and as long as you divide it by one over c squared, the two sides would be equal to each other. 
Okay, great. So that's the quickest way I know how to prove that Maxwell's equations um, actually generate electromagnetic fields, meaning fields that propagate through the vacuum of space. I had to make several assumptions about directions and dependencies, but it's my understanding that this is the quickest way to get between Maxwell's equations and the actual wave equation. It's not very general, of course. I've split this into only z directions, only x. Um, if you want to do the full vector analysis, you can get the full vector wave equation, but for our purposes, I just wanted to demonstrate that you can do it um, in the simplest way possible, which is here. Okay, great. I hope this has been um, helpful and clear, and I think one of the most interesting aspects of theoretical physics from the past 200 years is that you can take these equations, Maxwell's equations, which are derived in the lab, um, also have a lot of theoretical and mathematical background um, and interest there, but they were a combination of lab and theoretical work. And just based on that lab and theoretical work, four different equations can be combined to demonstrate that electromagnetic fields do indeed propagate through the vacuum, which is exactly what we see in everyday life. So to me, this is one of the major accomplishments of the past 200 years in theoretical physics. Okay, great. Thanks for uh, watching and listening. I will see you next time.